Now, <clears throat> now you may say, hey, it's not February. Why in heaven's name should we be talking about Black history? Well, actually, I was very happy to receive this invitation because for me, I believe very wholeheartedly that this is a conversation we should continually be having. Why? Because as James Baldwin said so wisely, history is not the past, it is the present. And I'm going to interrupt the quotation just now. This was an extraordinary week. The Derek Chauvin verdict had an incredible impact on not only black communities, but on America and our sense of justice. And why? Because we carry our history with us. We are, we are our history. And one of the things I think we're going to find out is that we are also responsible for our history. We are responsible not only for what <clears throat> not only for what we know, but also for what we don't know. And I think that this past summer of racial reckoning told us that. Why? Because as we watch the turmoil in the streets, how many times did we hear people say, well, I didn't know things were that bad. I didn't know that there was such a difference between Black America and white America. And I keep thinking, why don't you know? And again, not in a, a, an accusatory fashion, but in a fashion of, if you think about the knowledge that we think we need in order to live our contemporary lives, why don't we think that understanding the lives of Black Americans, lives that have so influenced the history of this country are important to know. I am so happy to come here today because I think you want to know. And <clears throat> excuse me, my allergies are just acting up this morning. I think that you want to know and I hope to provide you some links between what you maybe didn't know and what we should all share together. So anytime we're going to have conversations that, are, that may be dealing with issues that may make us uncomfortable or shift in our seats a little bit, it's very important to have a sense of common ground. So I lift these up just as a way of helping us have the most productive conversation we can have today. I'm going to ask you to be fully present. And here's what I know. None of us are blank slates. All of us have feelings about these issues. And what I'm going to ask is for you to put that, not aside, but on hold for a minute. Listen to what we are going to be talking about and sharing today. And then after we're finished, put the two back in and see how, if at all, the conversation has broadened your perspective. So to do that, I'm gonna ask you to be with me today as we go through this conversation. I'm gonna ask you as we have conversations to speak from the I perspective. It's not always useful to say, well, you know, society says, and I always look around and say, you know, I've been to a lot of cocktail parties and nobody has introduced me, introduced themselves to me as society. So if someone says something, tell me who it is who said it. Next, listen, listen, listen before speaking. Pretty common. And then lean into discomfort. Uh, again, these things are hard to hear. And then we say honor confidentiality. So I say lessons leave, but the personal stories stay among us. So is everybody pretty good with these, with this, with this set of common grounds? I've seen lots of smiles and some nods. So you ready to get started? Good. Well, before I get started, I know the screen went out. 
I did that. Okay, I did that just so that you know. Before I get started, one of the things that often happens when I do presentations on Black history is everybody takes out a notebook and goes, okay, I'm going to find out exactly the right words to say um, when talking to a Black person. I'm going to know exactly the right pieces of history that I need to know to enter into any conversation. Well, that's not really what I'm going to do because there is no magic wand. There's no magic pill. There's no magic book. I think more than anything else, the magic is what happens when we open our hearts and our minds to information. So, and that the best place to do that is not by looking out there at people you don't know, but rather looking in the mirror and asking about yourself. So just as an icebreaker, a way of um, getting started, I'm going to ask if we can um, play something called the Who game. And what the Who game is, is I'm going to ask you a question. And my friends from Westfield already know how to play the game. So I'm going to look for some really good answers from you. So, and what I'm going to do is um, ask you this question. I'm going to keep asking the question. And I want you to unmute and just talk to me. I want you to to give me the answer. Now, as I ask you this question, there's one caveat. You cannot say your name, okay? So, ready for the question? Nods? Is everybody unmuted, ready to play? All right, here it is. Who are you? you can't say your name. Who are you? It's, it's a spontaneous kind of thing. Just Shout out, just say it. Who are you? Me. I'm your activist. Okay, I'm activist. I'm me. Give me more. Give me more. Come on. You can do it more than a mom. Good. This is a kind An of old stuff. man. A man. <laughs> there you go. Who, who are you? A human. A human. Very good. Who a are Quaker. you? A Quaker. A Quaker. Uh, Someone came up with that one today. Who are you? <laughs> out of God. A, a, a dog. I heard dog. A what? Child of God. Child of God. Absolutely. Come. How about two more? Two more. Who are you? Teacher. Teacher. Excellent. Who are you? A student. A transient human being. A student and a transient human being. Those two go together beautifully. Thank you so much for playing. And if you could mute yourselves again, that would be helpful. Thank you so much. You know, I've done this game a lot of times. And what's interesting is that are the definitions of ourselves that we come up with. And if you look at the graph, um, at the graphic up here, you'll see that the, what you primarily came up with are many of the things that are the kind of first things that people see, right? I'm a human being, I'm uh, uh, our relationships. Um, and these are all what we would call our primary identifications. But you know what? We are more than just that. We are also all of the things that appear in the secondary. And if you see here, some of you said, um, talked about your family relationships, marital and family relationships. Some of you um, mentioned uh, where you lived um, and our religion, right? But as we go on, we also have these other identifications, who we are in industry, who we are in, in, in a role in a company. I was introduced as being someone from Villanova. And this helps us put people into a context so we can understand how to talk with them. And when we have, but even beyond that organizational, we have the culture. And as you see the culture, those cultural ways of seeing ourselves help us understand ourselves, not only who we are, but also how we listen and take in information. Now, one of the things that's interesting, and as I said, I have done this who game in many kinds of contexts, but in my classroom, 
it's always very interesting when people mention this. Do you see what characteristic is circled? Now, if you want, and again, this is audience participation time. I know it's Sunday morning and it's, you know, kind of nice just to kind of lean back. Here's my question. Who do you think mentions race as an identity when they play the who game? Minorities. Mo's? Yes. Right. You are exactly right. It is almost without fail that it is my black and brown students who will say, I am black, I am Puerto Rican, I am Mexican. And so now I would ask why? Why do you think that that, when I ask of all the, you can't say your name, but to say the first thing that comes to your mind, why do you think that becomes the answer that they give. We want to be recognized. We want to be recognized. Very good. But what is it that we want to be recognized? As a human being. We want to be recognized as a human being and? Have value. Have value. Thank you. And I guess I should have prefaced this by saying, I teach in a predominantly white institution. And so one of the things I think my students are telling me when the first thing that they tell me is that I am Mexican, I am black, I am Haitian, is that I don't look like everybody else here and I have history and that that history which you may not know, also prevents you from knowing me fully. And that's why, again, I think it's so important for us to really begin this journey of chatting about Black history. So thank you so much for playing along. And now let's get to, let's get to some of what I think is I hope will be interesting information for you to, uh, to, to hear. All right, so before we actually begin to talk about black history in the United States, it's important to understand that this notion of race actually um, was not coded on the DNA, right? It was created. And as students of long-term history, I think it becomes important for us to ask, well, why? Where did it come from? And more important, whose purposes did it serve? So when we begin to think about race and conceptions of race, here are the three most prominent figures for us to know. The first is Francois Bernier, who, and look at that time, 1620 to 1688. And what he did is that he said, um, prior to that, there had been lots of classifications of animals and birds and, um, and trees. But he said, you know, humanity can be put into species as well. And so uh, in a typical 17th century anthropological essay, he does that and creates what he considers to be really the landscape of humanity, right? And then following closely on his work is Johann Blumenbach. And Blumenbach, we credit for giving us not only what he calls the five great um, um, families of humanity, but also coming up with a word that is still very much with us today. And what he does in creating these families is that he creates these measurement values. He looks at the size of, to determine, now think about this, he is saying that this is determining 
who we are and our capabilities as human beings. He's studying not only, I have here the measurements of cranium, and also there was a sense of shape of the head. And uh, this is what he said determined who we are and what our potentials are. And so he came up with Caucasian, Mongolian, Malayan, Ethiopian, and American. Now, when you see American here, please don't think white American. Who do you think, what do you think he's talking about? Who do you think he's talking about? You have to unmute in order to say the word. Native, Native, American. Native, American. Native Americans. Right, the indigenous, right, the, the Native Americans. Because you have to remember, think about when he's talking about, right? He's writing this about 1820, right? So that's who he's thinking of. Now, the word I wanted you to take a look at here is the word Caucasian. And that he determined was the most beautiful of all the races. And because he had gone to the people, he had looked at the, he had specifically studied the people who lived at the base of the Caucasus Mountains and decided that they were the most beautiful people in the world. So you can see how the term we get today, Caucasian, is really from a, an 18th century sort of very limited notion of humanity. And yet it's what we use to identify people. So in actuality, it's kind of not accurate. But the one who influenced America um, in the United States the most is de Gobineau. And he was, uh, uh, and I use all of these descriptors purposely, French aristocratic novelist, diplomat and theorist. Because if you think about all of those identities, this is a man who came from great privilege, right? So that his way then of viewing the differences in the world came through the lens of his great privilege. So he decided that rather than Blumenbach's five great families, that there were three at white, black, and yellow. And the most important thing that he gives to the United States, and again, when you look at those dates, it becomes very important. He gives to the United States the sense that there is a hierarchy, a hierarchy that puts white at the top and then the degrees of variation from white determine the, your humanity or in essence, your ability. And black then goes to the very bottom. Now this becomes important because these are the frameworks that are going to guide the people who are going to be making the laws, who are going to be establishing the ways in which human relations in the United States will be configured until this day. That's pretty powerful stuff. And I would really encourage if you um, have a chance is to read um, Ibram Kendi's book, um, uh, Stamped from the Beginning. It is an incredible, uh, thick reading, not only thick because it's that, that dense, but he really goes through so much detail in where these racist conceptions come from. So I could spend much more time talking about these, but we need to move on. All right, so let's talk about slavery in the United States from 1619 to uh, um, really the beginning of the, uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, the Civil War. So as you look at the pictures here, um, what I wanted to show you was this, uh, this is actually not an actual picture, but a artist rendering of the uh, Virginia colony, 1619, when Africans came to these shores, not as enslaved people, I'm pointing and I realize that um, I don't have a pointer, uh, but it's the picture to the furthest part on the left of your screen. 
um, and that's the uh, um, the colony in Virginia, and the and the uh, Africans came as indentured servants. Now there were white folk who were also indentured servants, but as um, time would go on, the uh, black um, indentured servants would often have to serve longer, and they were off, very often treated more treated more harshly. Again, uh, we have um, historical records that that prove this, and more interestingly. And uh, my students always find this uh, good, is that when indentured servants would tend to run away, as they would do, guess who was easier to find in the colonies? The black indentured servants. So that now, while this may sound what it really does, it begins to start us on, on the issue of colorism in the United States, right? Because it, it, it sets off this difference. And this difference was clearly uh, assigned to status. The next picture, oops, didn't mean to do that. Let's go on. Um, the next picture is um, what I wanted to show you is that literally there were houses of, of uh, selling, right? And it's probably hard to see, but I will leave the slide deck with you but it says auction and Negro sales. So that this, and this is to establish that this was an industry, right? That the buying and selling of human beings was, was what we did. The, the third picture is, is, an, uh, is a picture of, F, of black folk picking cotton. And um, a, a book that I'm reading currently by, um, can't pronounce his last name, but it's my grandma's hands, begins with him looking at his grandmother's hands. And though she was a small woman, he writes, her hands, her, her fingers were so thick. And she said it was because she had started picking cotton when she was four years old. And cotton, you know, when we think of cotton, we think of yeah, I'm wearing a cotton dress and it feels so nice and soft, but that cotton bulb does not come easily off the vine. And it is surrounded by burrs. And as you try to pick that cotton, the burrs will just uh, tear up your fingers. And she talked about how the cuts that she started getting on her hands from the time she picked cop cotton as a sharecropper right, literally changed the configuration of her hands. And in this book, Risima talks about that when he talks about racism, he says it's too often we think of racism as a concept in our minds. And he talks about racism and race, um, racism living in our bodies. And that that metaphor of, her, of his grandmother's hands becomes a very powerful one as you read through the book. Um, and all right, who knows where this uh, last picture I put in just when I do Quaker presentations, who recognizes this? You can actually see it today. I'll give you a big, big hint. You go into Philadelphia. Germantown. There you go, right. And this is, um, and this picture was used as uh, the Pennsylvania Quakers adopted the first formal anti-slavery resolution in American history. Um, we don't have time to go through that right now, but that's another whole interesting story. All right, but as I wanted to, uh, um, wanted to talk about how, when we think about black history, we really need to think about the founding of the country. And I think of the founding of the country with really the crafting of the documents that make us Americans. And that would be obviously the Declaration of Independence, but even more importantly, our Constitution. And slavery was clearly on the minds and agendas of many of the, of the people who had gathered. And in order even to get the Constitution, 
three great compromises needed to be made. The first is one that I think many of us are, are, are familiar with. In trying to determine representation, obviously it was um, many folks said, let's just go by the number of people. The number of people in a particular colony, which would become a state, should be the way we just we, we determine the number of people who will be represented, representing us. Well, clearly the people who didn't have much representation didn't like that a lot. So they said, no, we'll just go with a set number of people given the, uh, you know, just, you know, like uh, per colony. Well, obviously the compromise was to have the Senate and the House of Representatives. And in the Senate, two representatives from every colony, from every state was what would, would be the representative. But in the House of Representatives, it would be on the basis of um, population. Now, here's where, here's the rub. In the South, meant those um, representatives wanted to count the enslaved citizens. The representatives from the North said, wait a minute, you can't have it both ways. For those of you who are lawyers in the group, you know that slavery was essentially a property law consideration because the enslaved were considered property. So um, the representatives from the North were, going, were saying, hey, are they people or are they property? So the compromise was that um, for every five, every five enslaved people would count as three people. Thus, the three-fifths compromise was, was born. But more importantly, is that this became a metaphor suggesting that Black folk were not whole. They were not equal. They were not deserving of recognition. Also, we need to talk about here is um, in order to keep this, there was also a clause, Article 1, Section 9, Clause 1, that kept the slave trade, the slave trade intact. In other words, we said that we would not abolish slave, the international slave trade, right? That is all those who were coming over through the, um, you know, through the triangle of trade, right? into the United States. So uh, the domestic slave trade was going to continue, right? And did continue until, um, until 1820. But we uh, essentially said, we're gonna hold off and we're not gonna let that happen for a good 20 years. And why? If you think about it, what it does is it allows the Southern um, slaveholders to build up their stock, right? And then the domestic slave trade would of course continue until its abolition um, with the 13th amendment, which I'll get to later. And finally, the, the next big slave, uh, next big compromise was the fugitive slave law. And this is um, if an enslaved person traveled to a free territory and let's say ran away, the question is, is that person, because they're now in a free territory, are they slave or are they free? And of course, the fugitive slave law says that they are still slave. Why is that important? Because it then makes slavery or the condition of slavery a human quality, right? That you are not a human being who is enslaved. And you'll hear that I often use the term being enslaved, but the fugitive slave law literally says that this slavery is born in you. And one of the interesting things is that in the particular, uh, um, uh, uh, excuse me, let me go back, that in the particular form of slavery that we had in the United States, um, we went on matrial lineage rather than patrial lineage. And again, uh, because I'm running a little long, I would love to get you to figure this out. Think about it. Why would you go with mothers instead of fathers? Because it was economically feasible, more feasible. 
because all if just think of it if your stock gets low all you have to do is you can get more stock by raping other slaves and that the, the that those progeny become enslaved there was um, uh, a sadistic quality to the uh, American brand of slavery. And again, in um, Ibram Kendi's Ken book, he, he calls this a peculiar American uh, quality to the, to, this, to the enslavement that we had. Um, going on, slavery then um, does end, but it doesn't end until, and I know I'm skipping over a whole lot, but that's, there's just so much that we need to learn but, uh, in order to really understand where we are now. When we think about the ending of slavery, many people want to talk about the Emancipation Proclamation. And if you were on Jeopardy and you were asked what ended, um, what, uh, ended slavery in the United States would be the, the statement, you might, you might think that the answer is, what is the Emancipation Proclamation? And you would be wrong. And the reason why you would be wrong is because the Emancipation Proclamation ended slavery only in the states that had, uh, were in rebellion against the Union, right? only in the states that were in rebellion against the Union. So that means that, the slave, that those who were enslaved in, in areas like Washington, D.C. were still enslaved. Now, the, the value, and I know I'm, I'm not, I didn't have a slide for this because I didn't want to spend too much time talking about this. The value of the Emancipation Proclamation was its rhetorical value was that it, it, it presented freedom for all in, a most, in the most concrete sense that it had ever been done in the United States. So that um, I think, uh, I'm not negating the value of the Emancipation Proclamation, but we have to see it as a war strategy more than it was a, um, uh, in, a you know, freedom document for the enslaved. So what ultimately, um, frees this, the, those who were enslaved is the 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment um, gives citizenship um, to, to those who, were, who had been previously enslaved. And most important, uh, the 15th Amendment um, uh, gives uh, men, let's be clear, uh, black, that's another whole issue, gives uh, black men the right to vote. Now, um, and I would say this is just one of those asides. Currently, there are more than 238 bills in state houses across the United States designed to um, minimize voting rights. And that is today in 2021. Can't, can't spend much time there, but I want you to see um, uh, where that all comes from. But let me go on. So one of the things that we really want to understand is reconstruction. And that's because I believe that what the current situation that we're living in right now is because reconstruction ended too early. But first of all, let me talk about what reconstruction is and then why it ended too early. So you hear the dates for reconstruction, literally um, the end of the Civil War until 1877. So um, what, so what you see in the first um, Condé, uh, Tom Nast, uh, Condé Nast, the first Tom Nast um, uh, cartoon is the typical picture of, uh, what a, uh, of, of what happened during Reconstruction. It was that notion that sneaky Northerners came down to exploit the South, right, uh, to exploit um, those who had lost the war. And um, however, if you look at the picture below, um, that is more likely who came down 
to the South to help those who were enslaved in terms of their education, in terms of um, learning how to live independently, how to manage farms. And um, very oftentimes we're, um, we're uh, Northern volunteers and not a few of them were from Quaker communities. So rather than the picture up at the top of the screen, it's the woman down in the bottom of the screen who was more likely when they talked about the carpet bagger, that's who it was. But the other thing I will say, and I'll talk about this later, is that picture up there, that was what was in my textbooks to describe what happened during um, Reconstruction. The other two pictures are pictures of when Reconstruction was going well. There were actually elected, uh, elected black officials, some of whom went to Washington, and there was um, great dignity given to the black family. As you see in the, in the picture, the, um, those who had fought valiantly uh, for their own freedom. But that all ended, and it ended with a contentious presidential election. Um, and it was Rutherford B. Hayes versus Samuel Til Tilden. And quite frankly, Tilden won the popular vote but Rutherford B. Hayes in the Electoral College was um, very close to winning. And he secured his win by um, saying to Tilden, look, if you let me win, I will end Reconstruction. So hated was the, was, was the reality of advancement of the black population in the South that Tilden gave up his, 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 uh, his fight for the presidency to end reconstruction. And when it ended, so did the promise of freedom that the Civil War had given black Americans. Um, so, and these two pictures captured that uh, compromise. Uh, in front, you see um, Lady Liberty crying um, on the left and on the right, you see the shaking hands with the Ku Klux Klan with that black family now cowering in fear. And why? Because if you look up here at the top, what had been the slave codes, right? And when we talk about slave codes, there were, there were actually laws about the ways you needed to treat your, those who were enslaved, that those who were enslaved, first of all, had no freedoms. They had no legal rights. They didn't even have rights to their own person, right? And that what happened was that, um, the Reconstruction brought an end to the slave codes, but the end of Reconstruction brought them back in terms of the black codes. And as you see there, that black folk were denied then their right to vote. They couldn't join militia. So technically they weren't allowed to carry arms. They couldn't testify um, in courts and different states had different rules. Um, different rules to the point that even some states um, banned black folk. And um, as you can see that um, this, these black codes, um, at least when I was born, weren't called black codes, but I bet you many of us in the audience would know that they, it was called Jim Crow, right? Those were the Jim Crow restrictions. And one of the frightening outcomes from that, and understand that legal loss of rights, that legal loss of, of personhood was that terror came to the black community. Um, another wonderful book, Douglas Blackman, Slavery by Another Name, contends that slavery continued from the, um, from the Civil War all the way up to um, World War II. Why? Because if you go back to the 13th Amendment, right, go back to the 13th Amendment, 
everyone was free except those who were incarcerated. So what happens? I showed you the, the, the slave codes becoming the black codes becoming Jim Crow. So in fractions, like not stepping off the sidewalk when a white person was walking, not tipping your hat, um, not carrying identification, being out past curf curfew could become life sentences. How? Because you were, you were um, taken to a local jail, given a very large fine, knowing that you couldn't pay it. And then what would happen is that corporations, many of whom were Northern corporations, would go to these Southern jails and purchase right, those who were incarcerated, paying their fines, and then giving the people ostensibly the right to work off their fines. But not only did they have to work off their fines, but then they had to work off their clothing. They had to work off their lodging. They had to um, you know, work off their food, right? So in essence, they never became free again. And um, Douglas Blackman, I need to, I always say this, was not a social worker or a liberal arts person. This was a business guy. He was working for the Wall Street Journal and was at a cocktail party. And someone said, you know, these streets were paved by my ancestors who were slaves. And Blackman said, wait a minute, that was like in the 1920s and 30s. And he said, exactly. And Blackman set out to disprove that this was true. And he found that many of the, that all that these laws, the the hat and the and the getting off were only enforced against black folk. All right. And I know I'm running long now, so I will move more quickly toward the end. So the legacy of slavery is living with racism today. Now, this is a trigger warning because I'm going to put up a picture, and it is a graphic picture of. It's a graphic picture showing the death of George Floyd. So please know. So as we look at terror today, this is terror. And what I would have you look at most especially is the picture is this picture. It was the casualness, hands in the pocket of Derek Chauvin. That is the terror that African Americans live with today. That is the terror that resides in the heart of every black mother as she sends her sons into the world. So terror is not new to the black community. When we think of racism, it is the marriage, according to Ibram Kendi, of racist policies and racist ideas that produces, and this is the most important part, normalizes racial inequities in this country. Normalizes racial inequities in this country. Here are the definitions of what those are. But I, the point that I want you to make is that we think that there is no sense of outrage. And I guess that's what I'm missing. And that's why I, I do these presentations is because that outrage needs to come back. And what is the outrage that we need to understand? We need to understand that racism is so normal in this country. So we have to ask ourselves, why is it normal that black men in America are 2.5 times more likely than white men to be killed in encounters with the police? Why? Is it normal in America for schools for the majority of black children to be underfunded and structurally unsafe? Why is it normal in America for black neighborhoods to be the dumping ground for industrial waste and suffer the debilitating effects of global warming? Why is it normal in America according to a recent study by the Harvard um, Public Health for um, the rate of, of um, 
of maternal mortality among black women to be so much higher than white women and for black babies to be in the highest infant mortality group. And why is it normal that according to the Brookings Institute that the net wealth of a typical white family is nearly 10 times that of black families. Why this topic? Why now? Because we don't know. And the fact that we don't know is also not an accident. This is an in, this is if you if you if you took uh, if you took a look at the 1619 project by the New York Times, this was one of the one of the things that we saw is that we have never been taught this. This happened to be one of the things I studied in my doctoral work. And I really didn't even begin to study it until I was in a math, until I was in a master's degree program. So the fact that we don't know this doesn't allow us really to come to grips with how serious this is. And I'm not going to read this, but you get the sense that our children aren't learning this unless we take the extraordinary um, steps to do, do that. And today we have, if you haven't been to the, um, to the Smithsonian African American Museum, when that opens, and finally, I just wanted to end with this quotation by, by uh, Maya Angelou and why we do this. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived. But if faced with courage, need not be lived again. And I think that is what we all want more than anything else. And now, I feel like Ferris Bueller. Any questions? Uh, yeah, we have time for some questions. So. Um... Or observations. Let, or observations. Observations, yes. Yeah, comments. So let's open it up to that. I think I just want to say thank you. And I don't even know how to say that well enough. Um, is your name Karen? Yeah. Karen, thank you for that. Because one of the things I don't get to say is that this is hard. This is hard for me to talk about. Because I do another presentation where I actually show the pictures of some of my ancestors. <laughs> and I actually, you know, and, and that, and, and I really talk about um, civil rights law through the lives of my family. And, um, you know, like when I talk about Jim Crow, I talk about the fact that my grandfather died at the age of 38 because he had an infection. And even though there was penicillin, there was not penicillin at the black hospital. Ugh. There was penicillin at the white hospital. And my grandmother, who was a chauffeur for a wealthy white family, knew this and asked the, the, the woman to please, the woman of the household to please just let, either let my, my grandfather uh, into the hospital or just get the, the medicine. And, and she said, oh, no, that just wouldn't be right. That's just not the way things are. And so when I say things like the normalization of racism, it's very hard to understand. It's very hard sometimes for me to say, this, had an in, this affected my family history. My grandfather had gone to college. My, I'm actually a third generation college student. My, my grandfather had gone to Alcorn State College and had gotten a degree in agricultural science. And he was the pride of his family. And then to die? Because racism was normalized. And what was interesting is that the woman my, 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 my grandmother worked for, as the story goes, was sympathetic, was sorry that he was dying and was sorry that he died, but just said, well, it's just not the way we do things. And that's what I try to convey through this, is that we have really been living in a very flawed and uh, in a flawed 
way of thinking about race in America. And that unless we actively challenge what we see, the racism, uh, some of you may have heard the term white supremacy, lives unchecked. And that's a problem. My, my question is, going back to Maya Angelou's quote, is how, how, what are the steps that we can take in our daily life to begin to change this? Joan, such a good question. And you know what, I'm going to actually start, I'll talk about myself. And again, I talked about, I didn't start to learn this until my master's program. You guys are getting lots of stories. I hope this is okay. Uh, but um, uh, I really went to, uh, to graduate school because I wanted, I loved rhetoric. I, I mentioned rhetoric before. And um, uh, I just thought that studying ancient rest rhetoric, uh, Corax and Tisius talking about probabilities was, I love that stuff. But you know, I'm, I'm sure many of you went, you know, no graduate school, you have to work, right? So, uh, and um, I wasn't a research assistant, I was a teaching assistant. And because I was black, literally, because I was black, they gave me the black rhetoric course to teach. And uh, <laughs> that was one of those things like, I don't, so I had a summer to prep. And I was in Boston at the time and had a wonderful opportunity. Um, and that was also one of the great things about being a master's student is that I got to go into the Boston Anthenaeum and uh, really begin to do some primary research. And it was in doing that research that I became literally overwhelmed. Why? There was no black history in my, in my high school. And I, I had taken a black history course that was the new radical course in my undergraduate days, but I didn't know this stuff. So Joan, the first step is you have to learn something. Mm -hmm. You have to know it. And um, there are so many books and so many book lists out there that, um, you know, I, I've given you a couple that are my current favorite, but what is so important to me is that you begin to, to have, to, to, be, to, to learn. And there are also, um, there are these days, um, and if you haven't learned about these, podcasts are incredible. There's the 1619 podcast series. I have not even touched the surface of that. There's a pod, I told you to read Ibram Kendi's book that's this thick, that's a podcast. You can listen to it. I listened to it the whole summer while I was, um, I would say jogging, but let's be, let's be real. I haven't jogged in years. I just walk. Um, you know, I listened to it. It took me the summer, but, you know, um, and all of my, you know, my daily walks, I listened to it and it was incredible. There are podcasts. Um, so even during COVID, you could keep there. And the great thing about COVID-19 is so many public lectures have gone online. And then the other thing, the next step, um, I am currently, I'm, what's happening when you, say, when you heard that I'm associated with both Swarthmore and Central Philadelphia, um, my application to transfer my membership from Swarthmore is in process to uh, uh, Central Philadelphia. Central Philadelphia had a wonderful uh, retreat on uh, racial awareness. Now it, it, it was dealing, dealing with the land and our, and our um, indigenous and understanding the indigenous communities better. I didn't get a chance to, 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 to take it because I was involved with other business, but those kinds of experiences of group learning experiences become important. You know, I think um, uh, then being able to, because ultimately, Joan, I think we begin to tackle the problem we get into meaningful dialogue. And mm -hmm. so many of us uh, are good with the comfortable conversations, but it's the uncomfortable conversations that really will make a difference as we move forward. Because it's when you begin to learn about experiences, not from like, I listed off a bunch of quote, a bunch of statistics that I gathered. Um, but it's when you 
talk to a mother, there's a organization. Um, uh, oh gosh. Mothers whose sons have been killed by the police. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had the number and the name and it just went, went right out of my head. But those women um, uh, came to, to, to Villanova to a class that, that uh, uh, a group of us were, were teaching and sitting on, just sitting with those women and listening to their experiences I taught for the whole semester. I doubt if my students remembered one thing I said. Well, they remembered what they needed for the test. But it was the experience of, of sitting with those women mm -hmm. and, and those women being a, willing to share their pain. No greater pain. That's the name of the group. Oh. No greater pain. Yeah. Um, was, I think, activated and uh, them in, in ways that, that our course never could. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the, so learning, um, becoming involved in experiences that require dialogue and then entering into personal dialogue too, I think is, are some of the best steps to take. And I, I don't mean to monopolize, but I just had one further question is, Please. I'm around a lot of um, immigrants. Sure. And a lot of them, will ask me, you know, what's this about? Like, like they're from countries that like, this is alien to them. And, you know, like, aside from giving them your slide presentation, you know what I mean, <laughs> I mean this, this is dinner conversation. This is, you know, over coffee. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I'm like, right now my answer is, this is such an intricate, multi-generational problem but i would like to if you had a resource that you know wasn't overwhelming um <laughs> absolutely mm -hmm. um oh, ibram kendi and i know i keep going back to him but mm -hmm. ibram kendi actually um has a book he joined up with um a young adult yeah. Uh, oh, writer to produce. Jason Reynolds. That's right. What is the name? What they don't call it by the same name. What's what's the new name of the book? Oh, I, I have it in the other room. <laughs> I know. I, um, I, I I am finding it too. <laughs> but but raise, you know, yeah. Reynolds, Reynolds and um, Kendi. Yeah, that's Reynolds and Kendi. It's a very accessible book. They read it. Yeah, oh, they yeah. just called it stamped. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. I, I read that. Yeah. And okay. I, and you know what, and the, and the thing is, is that um, one of the things, uh, one of my commitments, one of my post COVID commitments is I don't want to just tell people books to read. I'll mm -hmm. say, why don't you read a chapter and then let's talk. Great idea. You know, because uh, I think um, uh there's got if you think about it, there are a million committees you serve on and in this one committee and I wish I could say that this was an original idea but um I'm serving on a committee with a, another friend who um, um this is at work you know got a couple of copies and we passed them around and then before our committee meeting we have committed to start the meeting a little bit early and we talk about the book great idea thank you and one last thing is a lot of times people say, oh, well, we don't have that problem in our country. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> you might want to say, you know, if you know anything about the country, you might be able to look and say, hmm, maybe it's not race. Maybe it's colorism. Maybe it's socioeconomics. Um, I woke up this morning to hear that President Biden acknowledged the Armenian um, genocide, right? I think every country has its issues. Mm -hmm. and, and I will say that um, my understanding, I obviously have a better understanding of what's going on in the United States, but those issues are still existing in other countries as well. Mm -hmm. And I know that even on, on another vein, when I, um, 
uh, a lot of my work in higher ed is about how to help um, institutions of higher education become more multicultural, more diverse. I have colleagues in London. I have colleagues in Paris who are doing the work that I'm doing. Can we take another question? Uh, Karen Sandwald has a question. Oh, sure. Yeah. I'm sorry. I Karen? Have, I have a personal question. How do you deal or how did you deal with your own anger about all of this? Karen, what a great question. Um, I think for many years, I intellectualized it. Mm -hmm. For many years, I thought, let me write about it. Mm -hmm. Let me teach about it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't work, does it? No, it doesn't. And I think one of the things that I had to do, and I have a wonderful friend who is uh, Jamaican, and uh, he has this phrase about you have to be able to sit with it. And sitting with that anger is even allowing, even allowing myself to become angry. Because I think both by gender and by race. And I would say as race, I was really, even though we didn't have money, we were very middle class in values. And, you know, and I think both by gender and by, you know, socioeconomic status and, and race, I was taught to be very composed. And to be um, uh, being intellectual in my family was very also very important. So that it was, uh, in some ways, you could become angry, but that angry that anger needed to be controlled, um, and and never shown outside of the family. Mm. Right? And um, and then I, I became I began to realize, especially as I began to move move up. Um, in, in the administration at Villanova that I needed to make sure that these folks I was working with had an understanding that this stuff was painful for me to talk about. Yes. And I will even share, Karen, um, I will even share that uh, uh, Tuesday, or the verdict was on Tuesday, right? Um, the Derek Chauvin yes, yeah. Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, I was in conversations with other administrators about whether or not uh, the university, the president, should issue a statement if the verdict came out as it did. Because there were those who argued, well, it's all over. And as I, and I disagreed vehemently, and I will share with you in my mind, I keep thinking, what a white privileged <laughs> boy. Right? But knowing I couldn't say that, right? So I, I, I begin you know, in, in the very proper, you know, I have my pearls on, right? And my sneakers, but, you know, I'm saying, <laughs> well, I would think. And then before I knew it, as I just began to talk about the significance and the impact of the first big decision of saying that a, a, a white police officer did not have an automatic right to be judge, jury, and executioner. Mm -hmm. I was crying before the end. And again, I keep thinking, I'm a vice president. I shouldn't be crying, but I couldn't, I could it, the emotion of that moment came. just came. And so Karen, one of the things, one of the ways I've been dealing with the anger is by allowing the emotion to come. Even now, just thinking about just allowing the emotion because it's- But you know, people are afraid when you do, when you do express your anger and your feeling of injustice yes. and, and pe people don't like it. No. <laughs> Oh no, that, oh no. And, and I think um, I am at the age and so close to retirement. I think I keep thinking, if not now, when? Right. And I honestly think that they need to learn this. And, and in my own mind, as, it, you know, as I realized, I could have stopped talking and I just realized, okay, it's gonna happen. 
they need to hear this. They need to see this. Yes, yes. yes. And good for you. <laughs> I was a mess for the rest of the day. Let me just. <laughs> <laughs> But Karen, yes. What a good Linda question. Lots, did you? Oh, I'm sorry, Ruth Darlington. Oh, that's okay. Linda can go first. She she wants you to go. Okay. All right. First, thank you so much for this uh, conversation. Um, Medford meeting has had several call voicemail messages left by people who were objecting to our Black Lives Matter sign, and. As clerk of the meeting, I'm the one who has to follow up. And I'm just, uh, the most recent one was left by a retired policeman. <laughs> and um, I try mostly to listen when I call back, but I'm just wondering if you have any words of wisdom for, uh, clearly we're already on opposite sides of this question. So how do you cross that divide? Oh my goodness, if I knew that, I would have an award-winning <laughs> book. That's one of the things, you know, they're all um, there, you know, there are all kinds of, of quick things saying that um, when we, that all lives can't matter until black lives matter, right? Is one of the ways that, that I come down on it. And when I try to listen to people, Ruth, as you did. I think I try to hear where the fear is mm -hmm. because the anger is what comes at you first. The anger is what, and this is one of the things I think um, I take from being a Quaker is I keep thinking, help me, you know, I always say, help me, spirit, help me. This is, there is that of God in this person. Even though they may be calling me names, they may be challenging my, my right to be. Help me hear their fear. Help me hear how they feel invalidated. Help me hear their pain. Now, even though I tell you this and I can tell you, you know, when I try to, you know, be calm, they get madder at me. So I'm not saying that this is the answer, but there is a sense, Ruth, you also need to be satisfied that you've done your best. Because the other thing I know is that because we're in this confrontational, you know, kind of society, folks will never even tell you if you've convinced them at that moment. But I have actually had folks who've come back to me years later sometimes to say what you said makes sense. Maybe that's all I get. So that's why you have to be satisfied that you gave the best answer you could. I think we have time for one more question from uh, Linda. Lots. Um. I wanted to suggest um, in terms of people reading, um, it's important to go back, particularly from my generation and our generation, um, to look at the policy of the FBI called COINTELPRO, the counterintelligence program, because it was the deliberate undermining of leadership in not only the African-American community, but uh, other communities as well. And that was mirrored. Uh, some of you may remember the Phoenix program uh, in Vietnam, again, where if you destroy the leadership, then it's much easier to uh, maintain supremacy. Um, I just so wanna, true. Yeah, I, I just want to thank you also for, uh, uh, for sharing this. Um, for many years, um, particularly in the 70s through the 90s, I felt as though it was inappropriate for me as a white person to talk with the African-American friends that I had about slavery. I didn't want them to feel pulled back by that history. Um, and, and so I instead tried to talk about the empowerment and the other kinds of, you know, the projects they were working on to address the community. Um, but I'm glad now that there's more opportunity to really talk about it and um, I was able to take part in several 
sessions um, held at Upper Dublin meeting where people talked about the deaths of people on the Underground Railroad. And mm -hmm. it was Hi, it was very helpful to hear so many people talk about their own family's history of slavery and how that still touches people's lives now. Oh, yes. So I just, I wanna thank you for sharing um, this and helping now open the conversation. Thank you so much. I absolutely, absolutely think, um, and one of the things I would encourage people to do too is to um, look back in your own family histories. I've done that, obviously, as, but I think we all have histories back then and find out what was going on. But um, the other thing that, that if you, the thing that I've learned about is how clever my ancestors were and the and unearthing the family stories from great great aunts and uncles about how you know tricky uh, the enslaved were. Um, uh, you know, I had a, an, an, uh, an ancestor who uh, stole flour, stole sugar. She could have all the flour. She could she could have she couldn't have sugar. So one time she had some flour stuck down the front of her dress, some sugar, and it fell. And the the woman of the house said get down there and tell me whether that's flour or sugar. And she said, ma'am, it looks like sugar, but it tastes like flour. So, um, <laughs> but, those, but those stories are important because so, for so often we looked at the enslaved as like, you know, um, as without any agency, you know, as things. And they were human beings who were fighting in their own way for their own dignity. And I think that's what all of this is about. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Terry. Um, I'm hoping we can have you back again since you <laughs> have a number of different presentations. I would love to hear another one. <laughs> oh, you, you, you're going to become my third meeting. <laughs> <laughs> that would be wonderful. <laughs> okay, thank you all.